Okay, welcome back to another vid. So, what I'm going to do for this vid, and it might be a one-off, we'll see, but I really like the idea of kind of blending the pickup vids, but also morphing it with what I'm currently playing. Now, obviously in my vlogs, if you watch those, you'll know that I have a segment of what I'm currently playing, or what I have been playing. And, and that's great, and I'll continue to do that, but because I'm trying to make a conscious effort, you'll probably never notice it because they're so long, but I'm trying to make an effort to bring those videos down in length. And bear in mind they started off nearly two hours. To get them around about an hour for me is great. But going forward, I want them even less than that. Maybe 45 minutes to an hour, something like that. So it doesn't really give me a great deal of room to talk about games in terms of what I've picked up or what I've been playing, other than maybe one or two. So I'll continue to do that on vlogs, talk about one or two games, three maybe that I've been playing, but then perhaps maybe once a month, or like I say, it could be a one-off. I'll talk about um, other games I've been playing, as well as throwing in a few pickups as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is to very briefly, and I'm going to very briefly do it, because I talked about them in my last vlog. Now, if you haven't seen it, please feel free to watch it. There's timestamps in the description box, so you don't have to watch it all. It's just over an hour. But just if you want to know more about these next two games then that will be the video to watch. Because like I say, I talk about it for 15 minutes, or th these two games for 15 minutes. Whereas in this vid, I'm going to sum it up quite quickly. So the first one is Spec Ops The Line, and then the second one is The Saboteur. So yeah, Spec Ops The Line is essentially just a cover-based shooter. Uh, I thought it'd be quite a generic one, really. And it is to a degree in terms of gameplay. But the storyline really interested me, as, again, I went into great depths about it-ish uh, on my vlog. So, uh, yeah, but I do like it. It is a good game. It's available for the 360 as well, much like the Saboteur. But yeah, it makes you think the storyline as it's progressing, and particularly when it gets close to the end, and then especially after you've finished the game, you know, there's a lot of things in there which make you kind of question things that happen in warlike scenarios and who's right, who's wrong. Uh, there's quite a few choices in the game or decisions you can make. You're not really punished for doing it. It's more like a moral decision for you. What do you want to do? Um, and then you've kind of got to just think about that, I guess, maybe the consequences. So it's a decent game. Uh, like I said, there's a couple of things which I like where there's the interaction where you can shoot the glass and the sand will come down. That can help you sometimes kill enemies or it can help you kind of progress to climb up it and essentially escape from a building or whatever you need to do. Uh, it's never really explored too much in the game, but it's done a little bit and uh, I like it. It's something new, isn't it? Something interesting. And, uh, and that's that, so that's Spec Ops The Line. Next one up, again, I talked about it at length, The Saboteur. So this wasn't at all, or isn't, I'm 50% of the way through the game, or 49% technically still, because uh, I haven't been on it since I did my video the other day. Maybe I'll go back to it later tonight, I don't know. But yeah, I thought, uh, in fact, I didn't really know what kind of game it was. I just initially thought it would be like a first person shooter, but it isn't, it's a big open world game. And the best comparison I can give, although not directly, uh, it's not directly like this, it's like a Grand Theft Auto in the sense that it's a big open world game. You can choose to do what you want you know, within reason, do the missions, do the side quests, uh, go off and blow up all the Nazi installation bases, which is really addictive. They're scattered everywhere, and I mean everywhere across this giant map. And they're all divided into like districts of France, suburbs of Paris and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, the, the idea is to essentially liberate Paris and help save the day. And you play, the I can't remember his last name, it's Sean someone, an Irish character. And so like I say, you're in France, you're essentially, I guess, part of the resistance and you've just got to save the day really, ultimately. But I really like it. There's a lot of traversing around the buildings, up and down buildings. You can climb almost everything really. It's a little bit clunky and clumsy in places to climb. Sometimes you want to drop down or go up a lot quicker than you actually do because the soldiers can see you. They don't always see you. In fact, they hardly ever do. But if they're in the vicinity, if they're in that area, then they can see you. And you really just wish you'd get a move on with climbing up or down the buildings. But yeah, really good game. It's really surprised me. And uh, once again, I talked about it in more detail in that vlog if you want to know more. But I thoroughly recommend it. And I've got to say, it is a bit of a hidden gem or a sleeper hit. And uh, yeah, I stand by that. It's really good. I'm, I'm liking it a lot. And both those games are really cheap as well. You're not going to pay a lot of money for them. So that's that. Now moving on to two pickups, which I haven't played. Um, one which just arrived about a week ago. 
uh, the other one, I say I haven't played, I did play one of them when it came out, going back to like 2008 or whenever it was, and that game is Grid. Now, in the UK, in PAL regions, this is called Race Driver Grid. So for whatever reason, they dropped the Race Driver title, and instead it just goes by Grid. So yeah, made by Codemasters, and um, it's a brilliant game. Now, I think is there two other Grid games in the series? Grid 2, and then is it Autosport? I think that's what you call it. Now, I remember playing Grid 2, I think it was a demo on the PlayStation 3, and I instantly took a bit of a dislike to it. It didn't feel right. It didn't feel like the original Grid. It didn't look like it. It looked more kind of realistic, whereas this has got a much more kind of gritty set into it. The colour palette is like really dark, almost borderline apocalyptic in a, in a weird kind of way, but it looks great and it's really playable. The music is amazing. The menu music on this game, I could just listen to on a loop for hours. Well, maybe not hours, but it's really good. I really like it. Check it out. Just YouTube it. Menu music for Grid. Oh, it's really good, really soothing, uh, but kind of dancey and kind of techno-y kind of thing. It's brilliant. So, yeah, the gameplay is really good. And for me, this is far, far, far superior to Grid 2 and Grid Autosport. So I don't know what they were thinking there. I don't know if some people left this team who were working on this game and they didn't work on the next one, or whether they just completely changed the mechanics and the dynamics of the game and they wanted to go with it in a different kind of direction. Uh, if that's what they wanted with Grid 2, that's what they got. But for me, this is the best grid game. Again, an absolute bargain. You probably pay if you're in the UK, I don't know, the best part of like two or three quid for it. I'm sure it's gonna be cheap. And in the States, you're probably gonna get it for under $10 delivered. So the next uh, game that I picked up on the Xbox 360 is called Cubed, and it's a compilation. And with this compilation comes three games. There's Lumines, or is it Lumines? Not sure how to pronounce it. E4, which I've gotta be honest, I've never heard of. Heard of E3, of course. Uh, and Res HD. So yeah, if you like your puzzle games, and I absolutely love them, this may be for you. There's the front cover there, and on the back, if you can work anything out. So I love all those kind of neon lights, the dance music that comes with it, uh, the techno kind of vibe to it. Uh, yeah, I just I just love uh, love puzzle games, and I really enjoy playing them. Now I picked up Tetris Effect on the PlayStation 4 going back, when did that come out? A couple of months ago? Uh, so it would have been on a previous vlog where I talked about it, and I love it, but just puzzle games in general. I really like them, so I'm looking forward to getting to grips with this. It was really cheap, and um, but I want it because I love, I love those games, like I say. So next up is a couple of games, or are a couple of games, which admittedly, are one I've not played and one I've briefly played. The reason I haven't played this one, let's go with this first. The reason I haven't played this is because I've got the first game in the franchise and I've not finished it. So I want to finish that one first and then play this. And the reason why I bought this now, even though it's going to be some time until I play it, is because it was just for a really good price. And usually it goes for around about 20, 25 quid more. But you know what eBay's like? Sometimes when people list things for bargains, then you've just got to get it. And here's the thing. I mean, I could have waited, of course. I didn't have to get it. But I would have got it eventually anyway. As a matter of fact, I would have got it. So I looked at the price and I thought, and it had only been listed like a few hours. And I thought, well, if I'm going to buy it in a year or two or whenever then I may as well get it now and save myself 20, 25 quid or more if it goes up in price. Anyway, that game is called Jumping Flash 2. Like I say, the PS1 PAL version. So when it comes to the PS1, I'm sure I've said this many times before, I do buy American games, but I tend to favor where possible the PAL version. And yeah, you guessed it, just because of nostalgia. So this one looks exactly like the first game in all honesty, in terms of graphics, the aesthetics, the way it looks the way it controls. I'm sure there's a few new features to it. But yeah, I love the first game and um, it's quite deceptive. It looks as if it's quite easy and the first few levels are, but it does get progressively harder. I think it was a launch game as well, wasn't it, Jumping Flash? Pretty certain it was. Uh, I didn't get it at launch, but I remember seeing it at the time. So yeah, that's Jumping Flash 2. Really pleased to get it. I think in the UK, you're probably looking at around about 40 to 50 quid. Might be a little bit less, might be a little bit more, but I got it for the equivalent of 25. So I was really pleased with that. That's including shipping as well. And it was from a seller in the States. So extra bonus. I guess maybe if people saw it in the UK, then they just couldn't be bothered with the hassle of, you know, the, the trans, uh, what's the word? The, um, what's that word when you, the, the currency, convert, the currency conversion. By the time you've done that, and then by the time you've um, waited for it to be sent over, that could be a couple of weeks. So maybe people in the UK were like, oh, it's a good price 
well, I can't be bothered. So, luckily for me, I got that one. And then the next game, I have put this on. I've played it for maybe 15, 20 minutes, but the case is broken, which is really annoying, but big deal. I'll just, I'll just replace it. So I'm going to have to hold it kind of together like this. But the game is, if I can do it, is Mega Man X6. Again, PAL, PlayStation 1. So if I take my hand away, the glass or the plastic kind of comes off there. So, yeah, that's got a snap or a, a crack straight down the middle, but I'll just replace it in the future. It's not a problem. Now, apparently, and I'm not a fan of the series. When I say I'm not a fan, it's not that I don't like it. I've just never played them. I've never played a Mega Man game in my life, to my knowledge. So, um, but yeah, apparently this is the worst in the series on the PlayStation 1, and as a result, probably, it's the cheapest, but it can still go for a lot of money. But once again, buying it in America, I got it for around about 40 quid cheaper or more than what it goes for in the UK, so I saved a lot of money doing it this way. Um, and here's the thing, because I don't know how good or how bad the other ones in the series are on the PlayStation or the PS1, then to me, uh, I don't, well, I don't get it, because I put it on, it was all right. It looks good graphically, with that 2D look, kind of a 2D, 3D mixture. So it looked fine to me, uh, it played all right, it was responsive. So I don't know if it comes down to the storyline or if there's characters missing from this game that are in other ones, like maybe beloved characters. Uh, maybe they took the story in a direction which changed the franchise. Uh, I don't know what it was. Maybe there's features missing from the game or they introduced new ones with, which fans don't like. I have no idea, but what I do know is like I say, I, I quite like it from what little I've played. So, um, but I can't compare it to the others, but I'm pleased to have it. And uh, yeah, this is my introduction, essentially, to the Mega Man series, despite it being out for all these years. I think I may have briefly played one, actually, when I think about it, but it might, might have been on a friend system, it might have been the SNES or something, but it was so long ago, I can't remember. Next three are for the Atari ST, although one of them's kind of for the Amiga. Uh, let's start with that one. So it's Tusker. Now this is, a, I love the box, the box art, and look at that, the writing, that kind of Arabic sort of um, writing on there, it looks really, really good. So this is a game I remember from like the late 80s, this came out in 1989, and I wanted this for my Amstrad, but I never got around to getting it in the end. In fact, did it even come out for the Amstrad? I'm, I'm pretty certain it did, because it came out for the Commodore 64 anyway. But either way, I never got around to getting it, and it's taken me all these years, and one came up quite cheap, and to be honest, this was months and months and months ago I got this. I've just never mentioned it on, on my channel before. And again, this is a great thing about these vids. It's not just necessarily a pickup vid, it's of recent pickups. It could have been things I bought from ages ago, things I'm playing for the first time, or things that I'm playing for the, um, for the first time in many, many years. Because if I just, I should have said this at the start of the vid, but if I just made a vid, uh, like a, a, a pickups vid, then the chances are I'd hold it up and you'd never see it again on my channel. Whereas with these kind of vids, kind of like a casual chat about gaming in general, then I can go back and play games that I showed on my channel years ago. So I get my money's worth as well, and you get to maybe hear my thoughts and all that kind of stuff. Win-win, in theory. Sorry, I don't know how dark it is, but it's bloody pitch black while I'm doing this. So apologies if the lighting is rubbish. Uh, it might come across really bright by the time you're watching it, I'm not sure. Um, but it's, it's starting to get pretty dark outside because of the winter months. Anyway, so Tusker, yeah, this is, this is on the Atari ST. You can probably see the little uh, sticker down there at the front. Now, as you'll all know, the Atari ST and the Amiga boxes are quite literally exactly the same. You would not have a clue this was the Atari ST version unless you saw that sticker. Uh, sometimes it's on the side, sometimes at the bottom, at the back, at the top, wherever it may be. But the box art, the instructions, the, the same shape, everything is the same. And this kind of worked to my uh, advantage because I bought this game off a seller in Canada uh, with some other games and a couple of them didn't work, whatever, that's a risk you take with Amiga and Atari ST games. But it didn't, so this one didn't work as well. This one didn't work, I put it in the ST and it was just, uh, those bombs kind of uh, appear on the screen. In other words, the game crashed and I was really annoyed about it, but I thought, well, do you know what? I've kind of got the box for it. Essentially, it's the Amiga version as well, kind of, because of, as I just described, the same boxes are used. So I thought, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get a blank disc, I'm going to download the ROM, and then I'm going to copy it onto my, or via my Amiga 600, and then, you know, bam, I've got a full copy of Tusker on the Amiga. And that's exactly what's happened, because if I unbox it here, and if I get out the instructions, I love how these all come with their little, if I can get it out, Jesus. Um, it's like a Rubik's Cube, this thing. So they come with, you know, a little baggie, and the white discs, a couple of discs there, and then the instruction manual. 
So uh, that's in there with the, uh, the SD box, of course. But also a blank disc. Now I've not put a sticker on there, I've not wrote anything on it, but take my word for it, that's Tusk on the Amiga, fully working, and now is essentially, like I say, once I put it in the box, is essentially a fully fledged Amiga game. Brilliant how that works, isn't it? You can just kind of mix and match. So anyway, the game, what is the, the, here's the thing, after all these years of wanting to play it, it's not very good. It's a side-scrolling kind of action, no, it's not a platformer at all, a side-scrolling action adventure. Now, by all accounts, it's a really, really short game. Uh, I've not finished it, but I've seen, well, I've not watched the long play to its uh, conclusion, but I clicked them on earlier on, and it was like 10, 15 minutes for a long play. So clearly you can just really beat this game very, very quick or complete it. Beat or complete, depends how you want to phrase it. That's another thing. These days, everybody says beat a game. When I was a kid, that word was never used. It was always completed a game or finished. But whatever, I guess you've got to go with the times. Or it might have been a geographical region thing. But um, but yeah, so it's uh, they've absolutely ripped off uh, Indiana Jones. If you look at the screenshots there with the writing, you can see where it says um, Tusker. Actually, it's more on this side, Christ. Because the mirror reflection, it's hard to see. But um, can you see the writing on there? With, at the top, it looks very much kind of Indiana Jones at the top of the screenshots. And the character himself just basically looks like Harrison Ford with his hat, his cowboy hat, and his whip and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, you're just uh, going through what is, does it even say on the back, if I can have a look? I don't think it says, but it's basically somewhere in Africa, essentially, or like a Saudi, oh it does, yeah, it does say uh, Africa there. So you're in Africa, going through caves and jungles and the desert and all that kind of stuff. And um, the hit detection's pretty poor at times, I've got to be honest. There's one feature I quite like, although it can be annoying as well. And it's sometimes, at least the ones I've gone into, I don't know if they're all like this, but you can go into the caves and it's completely, well, almost pitch black. And But it adds a real sense of kind of atmosphere to it. Really eerie, there's some like bats and stuff in there. And uh, But that's annoying because sometimes they can attack you and you can't see where they are, so you've kind of got to run out. But you're trying to run out not knowing where the exit is. But it's kind of semi-realistic in a way. I quite like it. It's a nice sense of immersion, a nice little touch to make it dark when you go in there. So, yeah, so like I say, apparently a really short game. I've not finished it, but it's probably only a matter of time. And um, But it, it is a disappointment. But at the same time, because it's kind of nostalgic in the sense that I always wanted it, and I remember seeing this cover, you know, in magazines of the day where it used to be like the, the posters uh, essentially kind of advertising the game. And I always earmarked it as a title I wanted to get. So it's a little bit like Turbo Outrun, a game I've also got. I don't know if that's for the ST or the Amiga, I can't remember. But I used to be desperate to own that game because the artwork on Turbo Outrun is so striking with like orange and kind of uh, yellow backgrounds. And so whenever, even the game's pretty average, whenever I see that game, because I've got it and it's on my shelf and all that kind of stuff, it just takes me back. And it's the same with this. So it's not a great game, but I'm pleased to have it. And um, yeah, but don't go out your way to get it. But by the way, I should say it's quite uncommon I mean, wait and see, you'll go on eBay now and there'll be thousands of the things, but it is quite uncommon to get. So you may end up paying a bit of a premium, especially in that kind of condition. But if you're on the fence, wait. It's not worth spending big bucks on it. It really isn't. Unless you want to get it like me for nostalgic purchases. Uh, nostalgic, nostalgic reasons, I should say. Next up is a brilliant game. This is one I did play back in the day. Back in the day. And it's a Xenon 2 Mega Blast. It's on the Atari ST basically the same as the Amiga version. This again is in amazing condition. I've had this for a few years to be honest and uh, I think it was on a pickup video many years ago. So yeah it's just a shoot 'em up. It's a vertical shoot 'em up and it's I love it. It's absolutely fantastic. The music by Bomb the Bass and made by the Bitmap Brothers who've got a really good track record anyway. The music is brilliant. Now the ST is well known for not having great sound but from time to time music, uh, digitized music, is present in games. In fact, very often, to be fair, more than maybe what people think, and this is no exception. I actually prefer the Atari ST version to the Amiga version, the music, the menu music at least. It sounds basically the same, albeit slightly less quality, but it's still digitized music, but there's like an extra kind of mixed version to the Atari ST one, which, um, which just makes it sound more rockier, it makes it sound a bit kind of dancier, a bit more edgier, it just sounds better. It's only like a few extras, it's like a little bit of a sample that the ST version's got, but it does sound better. In-game music and in-game graphics, well you'd have to give it to the Amiga, although graphically it's not too dissimilar to the ST one. 
So yeah, it's a, like I say, it's a horizontal shooter, and, and the fact is the alien on the back. He is on the back. He probably can't work it out there. Look at that top photograph. So that picture there is a guy, what's his name? I think his name is Crispin. Does he look like a Crispin to you? Not sure he does. But basically that screenshot that you see in there is of his shop. And this is one of the things I don't like. One of the, It's a very minor quibble. But one of the things I don't like about Xenon 2 is at the end of the level, you because basically when you shoot the enemies, they leave behind these bubbles, which is essentially money. Uh, the bigger the enemy, the more the enemy, the bigger the bubble that you leave, they, uh, they leave behind, I should say and the more money that's worth. So at the end of the level, you've in theory collected them all, or as many as you can, uh, and then you can basically buy um, upgrades, whether it's extra lives, whether it's health, whether it's you know ammunition, different weapons, and all that kind of stuff. But the very first screen that you see when you go into this shop, when you go into Crispin's shop, is the uh, selling screen, So, but which is really awkward for me, because it doesn't make it evident, it, not really that you're trying to sell stuff. So for example, the screen loads up, you go into the shop, the screen comes up, and I immediately clicked on something, uh, one of the icons, and it made me sell it because I clicked to sell it. I didn't want to sell it, I want to go in there to buy stuff. So for me, what they should have done when you go into the shop for the first time is have the first option you see, what do you want to buy? And if it's to come up on the screen, what do you make it very, very obvious, but it isn't. It's kind of the other way around. So by accident, like I say, I'm clicking on things, selling it when I don't want to, and then after I've done that, then it takes me to what do I want to buy? I know that doesn't, I've not described that very well at all, but when you play it, you may see what I mean. So yeah, they should have kind of done that the other way around, really. But um, it makes me laugh because some of the weapons that you can buy in the game are incredible. I forget what you call it, but there's this one thing in particular, and it arms your ship to the absolute bloody teeth where there's like lasers, there's rockets, there's everything on there. And it almost, your ship almost takes up the bloody duration of the screen. It's massive, it really is. But the caveat to that, even though it doesn't cost too much money, but it's a fair amount. The caveat to that is it only lasts for 10 seconds. So that once you leave the shop, um, it's, there's a countdown on the screen, 10, 9, 8, all the way obviously into zero. And then it disappears and you revert back to what you were before. But as long as you've got that um, at your disposal, you just destroy everything. It obliterates everything in its path and you feel like a bloody god. You really do. But it looks ridiculous because it's so big, but it feels so, so powerful. Uh, it's a shame it's only 10 seconds, but if it lasted much longer, well, you'd just complete the game without losing a drop of energy. It would be a little bit ridiculous. So that's Xenon 2 Mega Blast. Again, another one, much like Tusker, that, um, yeah, came out in 1989. 1989. And that one holds up. I think Xenon 2 Mega Blast holds up Tusker, not really. Uh, the music, again, speaking of digitised music, the ST's got digitised music on Tusker as well. But the Amiga, as was usually the case, uh, is a little bit of better quality and is, is slightly different as well. So last but not least, what I've been playing on the Atari ST is this one, Jimmy White's World Wind Snooker. Now I had this one, I've got a little bit of an anecdote which I'll share with you. Um, any second now. So first of all, let me just open the box and this is so meaty inside. You've got one mass, in fact, that's two, one massive kind of instruction manual. And then you've got a smaller one here with like the rules of snooker and all that kind of stuff, a bit of a history of, uh, of the sports, the game and Jimmy White in general. So I think the irony out of all this is that, the, I mean, the, if well, I'll, actually I'll come to that in a second. First of all, let me tell you the anecdote. So uh, basically I remember 1991, so 1991, funnily enough, it would have been around about this time, you know, pushing Christmas of 91, and I was in WH Smith's, and I was looking to spend some pocket money, or some paper round money, or whatever it was, and I was looking to get a new game for my Atari ST, and I thought, well, what should I get, and I was looking around all the games at the time, but I did have one game in mind that I wanted to get, and it was WWF WrestleMania, and I haven't got that game now, but I, I'll get it in the future for nostalgic, you know, reasoning and all the rest of it. But from memory, on the front cover, you've got the British Bulldog and, oh, in fact, my, now my mind's gone completely blank. I was going to say The Ultimate Warrior, but I think he's on the sequel. Is it Hulk Hogan and Big Boss Man? Maybe I'm talking nonsense, actually, but I did have the game. I know the British Bulldog's on it for a fact. And um, so I remember picking that game up off the shelf, WH Smith's Christmas 1991, and I was umming and ahhing, do I want to get it? Would have been like 24 99 was quite a popular price back then for games. So pretty expensive, and as to someone like myself who was like 12 or 13 years of age, it's a lot of money. Um, but anyway, so I picked it off the shelf, 
held it in my arms or my hands and he said, held it in my arms. Uh, a bit melodramatic. Held it in my hands and thought, yeah, I'm going to get it. So I turned around, started to walk towards the uh, the till where the obviously the, the staff members were. And just as I was about to walk around there, who do I bump into but one of my best friends at the time called Rob. And Rob had an Amiga back then. And, uh, and I said, the classic line we always come out with whenever we bump into people, it's like, what are you doing here? As if like, why is it such a surprise? As if they shouldn't be there. I mean, it's a surprise in the sense that we weren't expected to see them. But, um, you know, what are you doing here? What do you mean, what are we doing here? He's obviously buying stuff, like everyone's doing in the shop. But, uh, and he was like, well, I'm just going to buy this. And he kind of held that up. So this was in his hands for the Commodore Amiga. And he was deliberating whether to buy it. He'd seen in magazines, it's got really good reviews and all that kind of stuff. And then so we had, you know, exchanged a bit of a, had a bit of a chin wag. And he said, what are you buying? I went, well, I'm just about to buy this for the ST, WrestleMania. And so, anyway, long story short, I waited in the shop with him. He ended up buying this. And then we went straight back to his house. His mum was waiting outside. And yeah, give my mum a call and just went, oh, actually, I'm going to be back in about an hour, going to Rob's house. And so I went around Rob's house and we put on uh, his Amiga, put on Jimmy White's. And I've got to be honest, it was, it was, and is a good game. And I'll touch uh, upon that more in a second. But I remember being a little bit bored because obviously Rob really wanted to get Jimmy White, hence him forking out 25 quid for it. But yeah, he was just on it all the time for the hour or two that I was around his house. And it was fun to be with him because he's my mate and we were having a chat and I was having a few goals on it as well. But it was like an hour or two of playing snooker and it was like, oh, for God's sake. I was just a little bit bored. So really, even though I was happy to be there, I was kind of at the same time, it was like, well, I'm looking forward to getting home and playing WrestleMania. Which, as it happened, wasn't an amazing game. It was all right, but it wasn't amazing. So anyway, that's my little anecdote of, uh, of Jimmy White from uh, back in 1991. So yeah, and I've picked it up. I picked it up again years and years and years ago, 15 years ago maybe. But I've finally got it again now. And um, it's good. It's quite an accurate kind of representation of snooker within reason. Now the back, as you can see, uh, it's kind of got that 3D kind of vector style graphics, which work really well. And again, bringing up the ST Amiga rivalry. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the Atari ST has a faster processor. So when it comes to things like 3D games, then it performs in theory, much better on the Atari ST, much faster, much quicker, and all that kind of stuff. But make no bones about it, for sound, for normal graphics, for scrolling, the Amiga wins. I'm not a fanboy of the ST. I had one for three and a half years before I had an Amiga, but I love the Amiga as well. You know, I, it's funny, because I knew more people who had an Atari ST than had an Amiga, but maybe it's because the ST was cheaper. That could have been something to do with it. But even back then, I had friends who had an Amiga, Rob, like I say, and uh, and others as well so it's not that i never played on it so i love the amiga i love the amiga and i love the atari st equally i'm just saying that 3d games run better on the atari st in theory at least so on this game there are four difficulty settings you've got tom which represents the easy level you've got dick which represents medium and then you've got harry and that represents hard Missed opportunity, of course. They should have had Dick representing the hard level. See what I did there? Missed opportunity, like I say. They really should have done that if they wanted to be immature, I guess. And then the fourth level is Jimmy. Oh, and just in case anyone doesn't know, and I'm sure you all do, but maybe you're not from the UK, Tom, Dick and Harry, of course, is a well-known phrase, like every Tom, Dick and Harry. Like, you know, Joe Bloggs kind of thing, I guess, isn't it? Is it even widely used these days? I'm not, I'm not certain. I've not heard anyone use it for ages. Um, but yeah, very kind of old-fashioned saying. So, um, yeah, and then the fourth difficulty level is uh, the whirlwind, Jimmy White himself. There he is looking very, very proud, and again, I think I shot that before, but there he is on the back, absolutely loving it. And it's brutal. It is absolutely brutal. Like I said at the start of uh, this uh, game description, go back a few minutes now, the irony is he's amazing in the game, absolutely amazing. He has 147 breaks right, left and centre, but I don't think he ever won the Masters, did he? Which is kind of like the top prize in snooker. Got to the final a few times, but never won it. Now, to be fair, he probably was the best player never to win it. But uh, yeah, technically, he didn't hold that trophy aloft. But he's still a great player, or was a great player. And uh, a bit of a, an icon of the sport, of course, as a result. But yeah, you put it on the, the Jimmy White whirlwind level, and you're going to get absolutely bloody annihilated. It is so, so hard. But the game itself plays well. It's quite responsive. I mean, there were a few moments where I did question whether what I asked it to do, it actually did. Uh, but maybe it was my fault because you can put spin on it, back spin, top spin, spin to the left, spin to the right. Um, there's, the, the, there's actually a button in the game, believe it or not, where you can chalk your cue 
So I guess that, in theory, it'll be there for a reason, not just for a laugh. It'll be there to maybe make sure that you're constantly, I guess in theory, you're gonna have to do it regularly to keep your cue kind of in, um, in, in with the best chance of, of potting the balls, I guess, essentially. If you don't do it, then maybe your shots can go slightly skew if. So maybe that's what happened with me. Maybe I didn't chalk my cue enough. In fact, this game on the front there is meant to come with a chalk, uh, a snooker chalk, a snooker cue chalk, but it doesn't. So I don't know what the previous person done with it. Maybe they lost it. Uh, maybe they ate it. I don't know what they did with it. But when I had mine back in the day, and of course when Rob had his, when he bought it brand new, uh, that snooker cue chalk was in the box, which was a bit weird. And it was a real one. You know, you could use it if you were a snooker player. And you, you know, you could just, um, you could have it next to your table. I don't know, quite know why they did that, unless it's just for a bit of fun. You know, why not, I guess? Uh, it's just a laugh, isn't it? So yeah, I like it. It's a good game. And uh, it plays really, really well. But it's just hard. It, oh, I should say as well that I had five games on it just the other day. I had five games. And the reason I had five is I was going to keep on going until I won a game. So it took me until the fifth go. Out of stubbornness. It was like, I'm not going to stop playing until I've won a game. So I had a game against Tom, which is, like I say, the easy level. And... Uh, I eventually won after five games, but the only reason I won, it went to the very last, well not the very last ball, there was three left on the table. There was the white ball, which of course is a cue ball, there was the pink ball, and there was the black. And it was my turn to pot, and if I'd have potted the pink and then the black, I'd have won. But, I missed the pink. I don't know why it said I missed, I thought I had it lined up to perfection, but okay, whatever. The game said I missed it, that's fine. Um, whether it was cheating or whether it was me getting it wrong, whatever. The fact is I missed. And I thought, oh God. So um, up comes Tom, pots the pink, and I'm thinking, great. So if he pots the black, he's won. If he misses the black, then I've got a chance to pot it, and then I'd win. So it was really close score line. And, um, and of course he did pot the black. However, in trickled the white after the black. So he potted the white by mistake as well. So as a result, it was a foul, and I was awarded the points. And I won, I think because of that, I think I won by like two points. So I won kind of by default, but that was enough for me to go. That counts, a win's a win, and then I knocked the ST off, and that was, uh, that was me sorted. If I'd have lost that game, I'd have been livid, and I'd have carried on playing until I'd, I'd have won a game, which I'd probably still be there now, to be honest. But it is a good game, I'm really liking it. And then last but not least, it's a brand new purchase. This only arrived yesterday, so it's still sealed, brand new, of course. And I didn't even know this game was out until just a few days ago, and it's Toki. I know a lot of people pronounce it Toki. When I was a kid for the ST, the Amiga, the Mega Drive, uh, me and my friends always called it Toki, so um, I'm always going to continue to call it Toki. And as you'll see on the front there, not the Retro Collector, like some people understandably say, but the Retro Lelector, I guess, edition. Uh, not really sure what that even means, to be honest. I've not looked into it. Is it some kind of pun on something? But um, who knows? So yeah, I didn't have a clue this was out. I had no idea whatsoever. But I saw a video the other day by Jay Cybersnake7 and he did an unboxing of this and I was like, well, I, I, you know, I had no clue. So I went onto Amazon.com and I said, I said, it's not an uh, Alexa, I didn't speak, or like a Siri app. I typed in Toki, of course, for the Switch and it came up at $150 and I thought, you must be joking. I want it, but I'm not paying that. But then I noticed that it wasn't through Amazon themselves. It was like a third party seller. You know where they list crazy, crazy prices. Hence $150, which is like 120 quid. And I thought that doesn't sound right. So I kind of looked um, at the uh, enhanced the picture. You click on it, made a bigger picture. And you may notice up the top there, it says only at GameStop. And I thought, ah, okay. So I went onto the GameStop website for the first time in my life. I've gone into the shop before, well, many, many times. Uh, over the last 10 years because there's one in the local mall and I've bought a few times from there as well but um but yeah so and this was on there and I think it was $45 which is around about 35 to 40 quid there or thereabouts so not cheap but not massively expensive for what it is you know lovely little box I love the colors very striking and the aqua um kind of uh, touch to it there very 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 nice so yeah and I bought it and then it arrived yesterday like I say still sealed. So basically, from what I can decipher, it's essentially the same game that it was back in the late 80s. Again, what is it with this, all the games like 1989? I'm sure it was 89 Toki, did it even say? Um, either way, 89, 90, something like that. And it's essentially the same game, but given a fresh lick of paint. Again, if I try and move my bloody arms out of the way, you might actually see it. There we go. And I'll put some screenshots actually on the screen. So yeah, um, it's the same game, same level layout, 
it just looks more modern and probably plays a little bit tighter too. But the, the original one still looks and plays well. I mean, I last played it probably two or three years ago, but I still like it. So really pleased to get it. And then also, and I think Jay showed this on his vid, so you may want to check that out. But you'll see there, it comes with this little kind of uh, card fold out arcade cabinet. And the theory is, or the thinking is, is that you form that, you put it, kind of click it all into place, and then you get your switch, and then you put your switch into it, and then it's like you're playing Toki on an arcade cab, which is kind of, it's obviously, it's a bit of a gimmick. It's a bit cheap, it's a bit cheesy, um, but it's a bit of fun, isn't it? You know, why not? A little bit like the Q-Chalk from Jimmy White, something a bit different, not to be taken seriously, and uh, yeah, why not? So really pleased to get it. As I say, had absolutely no idea it was out. So uh, yeah, and the funny thing about this, uh, getting this game, is that it's really got me back into the Switch. Obviously it's still sealed, I've not yet played it. But yeah, really started to get back into it. A system I thought I'd left behind. But um, no, not at all. I watched another video the other day by Soup's Eye View, and he was uh, waxing lyrical about Zelda, saying why he likes it, what he likes about it, and all the rest of it. And it's a very convincing argument. You know, it'd be very hard to watch that vid. I'll put a link bef uh, below, to, actually to Jay's vid as well. Please check them both out. Um, Jay's unboxing, and also uh, Mark, Soup Eye View his little uh, vid about um, Zelda. It was it, Anyone who's on the fence about getting it, that'll probably change your mind. You'll be like, I've got to get it now. So yeah, so I'm getting back into that. Uh, the Super Smash Brothers, I've never played the Smash Brothers game in my life. I've always wanted to, or for many years. And of course, one just came out the other day for the Switch, so I think I may get that very, very soon. There's uh, Super Metroid, which is coming out next year. There's Mario Odyssey, which is a brilliant game, which I've not been back to for ages. But I absolutely adored it when I first played it. I'd have talked about it on my channel. I loved it, I really did. And of course, what else is coming out or due out? Uh, Mario Tennis Aces, is that what it's called? Just again, a very kind of throwaway sports game, but it looks interesting for a bit of fun. So I think I'll get that. And what I love about the Switch, what I'm starting to love about it again, and maybe it's just a personal thing, I don't know, but I love how, I mean, that, that's the thing, isn't it? You've got the PS4, you've got the Xbox One, They've got very kind of dark and gritty games, big blockbusting games like the third party games that come out on both respective consoles. You know, the Battlefields and all that kind of stuff, the Uncharted, so you name, well obviously that's a Sony exclusive, but all these big, big titles and some of them are quite dark and gritty as I say. And don't get me wrong, there's a time and there's a place for them and I really like them, absolutely. But sometimes I kind of want to go back to almost my childhood in a way and I want that bright, those bright colours and that fun those kind of cartoon characters and it just reminds you or reminds me that you well I anyway I'll speak for myself uh, that I game for fun I don't really game to get stressed out or to take things really seriously with this amazing acting and voice work and big super scores you know from like the equivalent of John Williams in the background and all this emotional kind of hard-hitting stuff like The Last of Us which is a great game don't get me wrong um, but I can do with all out that at times and the kind of super realistic graphics or as good as they are right now They're not quite realistic of course, but the PS4 and the Xbox one as it stands Certainly when consoles are concerned, that's the best we can get It's the closest to reality and there's a time and there's a place for that But I kind of miss that kind of cartoony game world and Nintendo kind of does that better than anyone else So I'm, I'm kind of going back to that so it'll be very interesting to see 2019 onwards, especially 2019, uh, as it's just around the corner, whether I kind of get back into bed, uh, back, you know, back into bed, I should say, or jump back into bed uh, with Nintendo. What a slag. Nintendo one minute, then it's back to uh, Sony PlayStation, and then it's Xbox, and then it's back to Nintendo and PlayStation. Um, but yeah, I think I will. I think I might actually jump back into bed with uh, with Nintendo and the Switch. I'm not going to get rid of the PS4 anytime soon, don't get me wrong. It's a brilliant system. But uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying the Switch. And maybe, I guess, expect more of that in the future on my channel, Twitter and wherever else. Anyway, thank you for watching. It's been another long vid. Of course it has. Uh, it may be a one-off, you know, when it comes to these kind of vids. Uh, or maybe not. I might do more and many, many more in the future. Time will tell. Anyway, thank you for watching. Until my next vid, see you later. Oh,